Howdy, howdy. All right, we are here for episode three of our family history. And we are working on the story of Leroy Hansen. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Um, so we finished off that um, they were, they had passed Thousand Springs. So they're on this mega journey back to Idaho, right? So, or I'm a, well, they're currently in Idaho, but they're on their mega trip back from in covered wagons from California all the way back to Utah. And it is 1915, if I remember right. It was 1915, like a little over a hundred years ago, they are taking covered wagons. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> Say that again. Three covered wagons, yeah. Yeah, three covered wagons, but I think they're down to one because they the horse died and um and then they sold one or maybe maybe they have two but they definitely got rid of one yeah okay. um okay uh and they were they had um stayed at this the house of the mormons that they should they should have avoided down in the in the river valley or something like that <laughs> yeah um, and these guys were really nice and gave them water and, and food and stuff um and by now we were getting into the burley area burley idaho I don't remember too many particulars of, about this area, except for that one day I turned eight years old, September 13th, 1915. Wow. And they left. So they've been on this trip since July 1st. So July 1st to September 13th. And they're wow. not even, I guess they're over halfway, but they're not that far. <clears throat> Dad and mother took us kids to the white, the white top buggy on a side trip over to see the Shoshone Falls. I remember as we rode out to this plateau to look over at those falls, how they were coming down and foaming at the bottom. I never saw those falls again until about four, I was about 40 years old. It seems unusual to me that when I look at them, they look exactly as I remembered the day that I turned eight. Wow, that's wild. Let yeah, me man. share uh, a picture. Yeah, it looks really cool. Yeah. Uh, um, I think that these are like one of the largest waterfalls in, in North America or something like that, if I remember right. Yeah, I pulled this picture up. There's obviously uh, just a bunch of them, but look how cool that looks. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. It's really pretty. Should we show them this? We put this together a second ago. Yeah. You want to go over it? Yeah. So this was Gridley, California, um, above Sacramento. And then we were outlining the trip that they had taken, uh, or I guess that they're on right now in this part of the episode. Uh, but yeah, they started through here, went through these mountains, and then we're not quite sure where they went, we put Lake View in a, as a placeholder, but we think maybe they went up even more towards Boise. This is the, where the Oregon Trail kind of goes this way, I think. Anyway, then goes all the way down and it seems like they end up in Goshen again. Yep. And so where are they right now? They're kind of by Burley? Yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. Cool, okay, so, um... <clears throat> So the waterfalls look the exact same as when he turned eight. Well, we left the Burley, Idaho area and headed southeast over towards Strayville, S-T-R-E-V-E-L-L. -L. And that was a long open ride from Burley down. The thing that I can remember well is that we passed the Sawtooth National Forest. The leaves were beginning to churn. It was towards the end of September and the aspens and oak leaves were turning into their fall colors and they impressed me quite vividly because he probably didn't really see that near as much because in, in California, it's a little bit more, I don't know, mild, mild climate. It was, yeah. it was really pop, man, in Utah sometimes. Yeah, for sure. And I'm just remembering he was born in Gridley because his family was from Goshen. Yeah. But, like, but also Goshen doesn't have those colors really that much either down there in Utah. But uh, I'm realizing that anyway so they're on their way back yeah and he's yeah this is all like brand new stuff to him this is like yeah. shocking stuff yeah <clears throat> we made our way 
a ways on east towards Tremonton. The reason we were headed into Tremonton was because mother's sister, Emma, and her husband, Lester Kimball, had a farm there. Living with them were my grandmother, Martha Christensen, and of all things, her mother, uh, Pyrene Ewell Jameson. Okay, I don't know if we have been introduced to them yet, like in their back story. Oh yeah, I think we, I think. We know some of the Christiansons, but I don't remember those names. Yeah. So his grandmother and her, so he met his great grandma. So our great grandpa, who we both met, met his great grandma. Oh, wow. we'll have to do some like family math on that. That's like a long yeah, way back. But, holy moly. So how many generations is it that I met someone and they knew people that far back in? Yeah, like when was she born? Uh, uh, 18, I don't know. Could have been like 1850 or something. Uh, yeah, her name is, maybe we can find it, P-I-R-E-N-E, -E -E Ewell oh, we Jameson. Yeah. Uh... 1835 to 1923, if this is her, I think. Utah deaths. Yeah, yeah 1923, has... that'd be right. Alex Jameson, his husband? Yeah, I think so. Wow, that's wild. So yeah, we, we met someone who, who met someone that was born in 1830. Yeah, and I bet that might not be the oldest person you ever met, too. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh, we're one generate like we are one. That's crazy. Yeah, one handshake away from somebody in the 1800s. Yeah, like earlier 1800s. Wow, that's crazy. <clears throat> okay, when we arrived in Tremonton the first day of October, it was the first time I'd ever seen my grandmother. We were all happy to be together after so many years apart. We had a happy reunion there for quite a few days. And I remember it was harvest time because Uncle Lester was harvesting his sugar beets. We helped him put up his crop. My brother Lynn cut his sugar beet tops off with a big knife and he cut his thumb real bad. He had to be taken away to a doctor who sewed the end of it back on. What? But he got along pretty well. <laughs> Whoa, that's, that's crazy. Funny. Uncle Lester and his beats. That's funny. Yeah. And a ripped off thumb. Yeah. Okay. Dad rented a house in Tremonton where we lived for a month or so, and he put us kids in school. I can remember going to school there, and then we decided to move back to Goshen, Utah. So dad took the team and wagon and the four oldest boys, mother, Wilford and I went on the train. They went on a train and we all wound up in Goshen. We went back to the old Hanson farm where Uncle Hiram lived. Uncle Hiram was dad's brother. He had arranged for us to lease a piece of ground at Medessa. We farmed this piece of ground that winter and the next summer on shares with the owner of the ground. So we spent a week or so in Goshen with Uncle Hiram and then moved to Medessa. Isn't Medessa just like down the road, like super close? Didn't we look this up? Uh, I was just trying to look it up. And oh, sorry, it's Medessa, M-E-S-S-E-D-A. M-E-S-S-E-D-A? E-D-A, yeah. Weird. Did you find it? Um, sorry, somebody's looking at my window. Um, yeah, there's no, I actually didn't find it. M E M E S S E D A doesn't show anything in Utah. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Somewhere, maybe Modessa is spelled. Oh, oh, look at this. Hold on one sec. I got to go on mute. All 
Okay. Did you find something? Yeah, I found it. Um, oh, I just spelled it different, I guess. Yeah. So I'm taking a screenshot of this and then um, we can put it in the, I'll drop it into the. Oh, it's by the uh, Utah Lake. Yep. So right up against Utah Lake on that. So I feel like we've driven through that. Um, didn't we drive on that west side at one point of Utah Lake? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're okay. Probably driven. <clears throat> so they farmed this piece of land out there during the winter and next summer on shares with the owner of the ground. We spent a week or so in Goshen with Uncle Hiram and then we moved to Modessa. It was in November and colder than cold. When we arrived at Modessa, the people hadn't moved out of the house we were supposed to move into. So we put our stuff in an old granary and lived there. Boy, it was cold. It was snowing and we could see daylight through the cracks of the granary. I can remember mother saying that we kept a fire in the wood stove all night long and yet the water she had on the back of the stove would freeze. So that sounds cool. Frankie was the person who dad was leasing this farm from and he lived in Eureka. His mother and dad were living in the house that we were supposed to move into. They were hesitant to move out on these cold winter days. One day dad went over there and told him, boy, you better have your things ready because I'm going to have my wagon here in the morning and you better be ready to move out because I'm going to take you out whether you want to or not. So sure enough, dad moved them out and up to Eureka and we moved into that house. As near as I can remember, it was a two room house, pretty well insulated so that we could keep it warmer than it had been in the old granary. About a mile east there was a one room schoolhouse Dad put us all in school in grades one through eight. We spent the winter going to school. Wow. That's crazy. You know, way like on the west side of Utah Lake, you know, one room schoolhouse all winter long. What did he say about Eureka though? Was that 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 these these other people that um, that they were renting the land from? They were staying in that house um, mm. and they, he kicked them out basically and they moved back to Eureka. Oh, I see. I see. <clears throat> okay. Well, springtime came and dad started planting his crops and cultivating them and trying to make a good farm out of it. On this farm, we had a lot of hogs. We must have had 250 heads of pig. Dad was supposed to take them. Oh, wait. Dad was supposed to take care of them. When spring came and the crops were in, it was up to us kids to turn those pigs loose and keep them away from the crops and let them forage out in the fields. Well, it fell upon Bert and me to take care of them pigs. I remember we brought the pigs into their pen one evening and took them up about 100 yards to a watering trough and let them have their water before we put them away for the night. This evening we heard them all in the pen, but there was one little pig about half grown who wouldn't go into the pen. <clears throat> oh yeah, I think I've heard this story, it's kind of sad. He walked right up to the door and grunted and turned around and ran back out to the water trough. He did that about four or five times and Bert said to him, said to me, now you go up and run him back down here and I'll take care of him. He picked up a rock about the size of a grapefruit and stooped down behind a big weed. I went up and chased the pig down past Bert, who raised up and whammed him right in the butt of the ear with his rock. Down he went. He wiggled and squirmed and he wiggled and then he went still. I'll tell you, Bert and I were scared. We'd killed one of dad's pigs and we just wondered what in the world we should do with him. Should we tell dad or should we clean him out and eat him? <laughs> Should we bury him and forget about it? <clears throat> we just stood looking at him and we were worried sick about what to do. All of a sudden, the little pig jumped up and ran to that pin just as hard as he could go. And I'll tell you, he didn't hesitate. 
when he got to the door. He went in there <laughs> and we went in quick. That was quite a pig story because that little guy grew up to that next summer and fall, he carried his head on one side. So he guess I got, he, he got a real lesson taught to him. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Poor little pig. Knocked piggy. him out. Yeah, yeah, knocked him out cold for a few minutes and then he eventually got to. Wow. All right. Um, uh, this farming area in Medessa was under an irrigation system. There was a huge electrical pump down on Utah Lake, and it would pump the water up the hill to those farms. The water would run back down the hill to the irrigation to irrigate the crops. Well, all of the um, all of the crops got in, and they were coming along just beautifully when. Of all things, the electrical motor on these pumps burned out. And of course, the crops burned up. In other words, the farming in that area turned to be quite a disaster. Whoa. So they were super reliant on those pumps to like pump water up, and then they died. That's pretty crazy. So while we were living in Medessa, my uncle Hiram came down with one of his friends in a buggy and picked me and took me up to Goshen. On the way there, he killed two or three coyotes, and I can remember seeing these coyotes laying on the back of the buggy. The reason he took me to Goshen was that I was that I was eight years old, and it was time for me to be baptized. So this Saturday afternoon, Uncle Hiram took me, dressed in a pair of old overalls, up above the ditch into what was their duck pond and baptized me. <laughs> the next... <laughs> The next Sunday, he took me to Goshen to church and confirmed me. And I was confirmed, and that was my confirmation into the Mormon church. Wow. I wonder why I wonder, this is Uncle Hiram. Yeah, I have no idea. Maybe he was more active and, I don't know, more religious, or maybe they didn't have another church or something nearby. Yeah. Okay, um, we spent the summer and fall there in Medessa, and when school started in September, Dad decided he couldn't make it there any longer, so we moved back to Goshen. He put us kids in school in Goshen and got a job hauling ore from Dividend down to the railhead, which was at Goshen at the time. He would go up to Dividend, D-I-V-I-D-E-N-D, in the morning with his team and wagon and hauled down a load of ore. So they were hauling ore around, I guess. So, Cause that's, mm. that, was, that was like a giant copper and tin mine or a tin mine or something, right? Like out there in Eureka. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was an old silver mine and, and yeah. yeah, I'm sure that, yeah, something like that. Um, well, I'll keep going. This winter must have been the winter of 1917. I spent it going to school in Goshen, and I must have, I must have been quite backwards in my schoolwork because I had been held back so much with malaria fever. And then that one year in Medessa was the one-room schoolhouse. I'm sure I didn't get much of an education, so I must have been in the third grade in Goshen. One time, there was a fellow who came to Goshen to show a motion picture, and he held a matinee in the afternoon for the school kids. There was something wrong with what I had been doing in school. I hadn't learned my lesson right, or I had been naughty or something. So the teacher was going to make me stay after and miss the show. The teacher played the piano at the time for the school kids to march out. And when she went to play her little, her little thing on the piano, I crawled out of the window and went to the show. <laughs> wow, that's funny. That was the first motion picture I ever saw. And, and I remember the title, it was, uh, the title of it was The Eye of the World. Huh. I don't know, I wonder if we could find that. Dude, that one, that's like a, Tough life, man. Living out in the middle of nowhere. That is yeah. so far out in the middle of just like nothing. Even today, that's, I guess it's maybe even more barren now. Yeah, it says Eyes of the World is a 1930 film. Does that seem right? 1930? 
No, it'd be like 1917. So, I don't yeah. know. Oh, yeah. There is one, uh, 1917 version. Wow. Yeah. Eyes of the World. Does it have a, like a link on YouTube or? Uh, it's IMDB is right here. I, I'll just show it real quick. The Eyes of the World, 1917. Wow. That's crazy. Huh. Yep. Willard goes west. Um, all right. We spent that winter in Goshen, and the next spring we moved from there to Clear Creek, Utah. Oh. Um, and if I remember right, this is like way up in the mountains. I'll tell you the circumstances of why we moved. Mother's sister, Barbara, and her husband, Johnny Rowe, lived in Clear, Clear Creek. And at the, that time, the First World War was going on, and there was a need for props for the coal mines. The coal mines were going real strong, and they needed timber. Dad had a team or two, and he figured that if he went up there and cut timber and hauled them into town, he could make pretty good money. So he mo moved to Clear Creek. It was in the spring of 1918. Clear Creek was quite a nice place. We enjoyed it. It was about, I was about 11 years old and was really happy. We moved into a little two room house because the housing shortage was bad. But anyway, we worked up in the mountains, cutting timber and hauling it down into the, uh, on the wagon into Clear Creek for mine props. Wow. Mine um, props. Yeah. So like, you know, they dig a tunnel, but then they need the wood to hold it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can show where Clear Creek is. Yeah, that'd be great. So they were over here. This is where Goshen is right there. Yeah. And while well, they were in, Mos I think it's called Mosida or Mos Mos Masada or something. Yeah. But anyway, and then Clear Creek is over here in the mountains, like you said. Wow. So it's like near... Way up by, oh, Schofield. But Soldier Summit, you go up to Soldier Summit and down. Kind of by almost to Price. Like Price is like down the mountain from there. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, from zoomed way out. Yeah, right there. Um, cool. Well, let's, let's add that to our, our chart. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think they, yeah, anyway, I think they eventually moved to Salt Lake. Um, there was a little incident there I might mention. When we moved from Goshen to Clear Creek, my brother Lynn and I, just us two, took a team and wagon and our belongings and moved to Clear Creek. Wait, he just said he was like 12, right? Yeah. Man, they're like, oh, no, he's 11. They're like, hey, 11-year-old, can you just take a team of horses and a buggy up to, like, move all of our stuff? <laughs> we took off up Spanish Fort Canyon and through the Red Narrows. I was 10 years old and Lynn was 14. We spent the night at Soldier Summit and we went on to Clear Creek the next day. I can't really tell you why just the two of us made this trip. Wow. That's crazy. I just That's drove wild. up there. Um, and it took me only 45 minutes from Salt Lake. <laughs> to Soldier Summit? Yeah, uh, I was kind of up there camping. But yeah, Soldier oh, yeah. Summit. I don't remember if Faye or Floyd were working with us in the timber. However, Lynn, Bert, Dad, Bill, and I all worked through the summers for about four or five years cutting timbers for the mine props. We'd go to school in the winter time. We couldn't cut timber in the winter because there'd be about four to eight feet of snow up in the mountains. 
Lynn, Bert, and Dad would cut the timber and trim it all up, and Bill and I would hook it up to hook it up to it with a horse. We would ride the horse and tie the log cabin or, or the uh, tie a log chain around two or three logs and pull them down a skid row where we could get them loaded onto a wagon and take them into town. I remember an incident that will be worth well worth recording. One trip up the mountains where we were cutting timber, my brother Bill was riding up a horse in the skid row. About seven or eight timber wolves walked right out and stood on the trail in front of him. Wow. He said they were gnashing their teeth and growling and showing signs of violence. But he got up to where the rest of us were and he was scared to death and really bawling. I'm guessing he had quite the experience seeing that many timber wolves. Now, I'm sure these animals were timber wolves because we saw very few coyotes while we were in the mountains. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. Um, and there's not wolves around there nowadays, probably. Yeah. Let's talk about going to school in Clear Creek. Faye and Floyd graduated from the eighth grade in Goshen so that left us four younger boys to go to school in Clear Creek. I guess that's when you graduated. You're like done in eighth grade. You're like, I'm done. Um, I was in the fourth grade and Bill must have been in third. Lynn and Bert were in the same grade, which was the seventh grade. Bert caught up to Lynn when he was in the sixth grade. So the four of us graduated from Clear Creek School through the eighth grade. I might not be bragging here to say that when I was in the eighth grade, I was elected president of the student body. The student body. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how many, did he say how many uh, students or how big that school was at all? Uh, well, literally the next sentence is, there must have maybe been maybe 100 to 150 kids going to school at that time. <laughs> wow. I just thought it might be worth mentioning, not that it means anything. So yeah, he was pretty excited about that. <laughs> the following year after I graduated from the eighth grade, I went to Price to go to ninth grade. Price, Utah. I stayed in the dormitory over there and walked up to Carbon High School. Holy moly. Bert and I went through the ninth grade at Carbon High. I had a good time there and made lots of friends and lived in a dorm in ninth grade. Hold on one second. Well, I'll just keep reading. Well, we'll talk about some other things that happened in Clear Creek. The year we got up there was 1918 and there was a bad flu epidemic and dad got it really bad, the Spanish flu. He was extremely sick for about three months. And I remember the doctor told him, Joe, if you had used cigarettes, the Lord himself couldn't have saved your life. So his dad got the Spanish flu in 1918 and almost died. And good thing he didn't smoke because the doctor said if he smoked, Jesus couldn't save him. Yeah. It was in Clear Creek that many things started happening family-wise. Faye met his wife, Elva, there and married her. Floyd met Nora there and married her. Lynn met Mila and married her. Bert married May, and that marriage ended in divorce. My older brothers and Bill, two... Um, this is a funny sentence, but my older brothers and Bill were pretty good musicians. Of course, they were rather isolated in Clear Creek and had to make our own entertainment. So the boys formed an orchestra and had to make our own. Inter um, oh, I read that funny. Dad, Lynn, Bert, Faye and Floyd and I and even I played and we formed what was known as the Hanson Brothers Orchestra. Through the years, we played a lot of dances and a lot of shows and plays that were put on by the people around there. Besides that, there was a basketball court in the schoolhouse 
and they played basketball all winter long, and we formed a Hanson Brothers basketball team. And I tell you, we were hard to beat. Everybody in town tried to beat us, but nobody ever did. <laughs> nice. Uh, they're pretty good. Um, well, I think that's good for today. What do you think? Yeah, a lot of interesting stuff. That's uh, Does he go through his whole life? Because he's only like 14 or something right now, right? Yep, he goes through his whole life. Wow. So, yep, we uh, we get it all. Um, I, well, actually, let, that's not 100% true. It actually goes until he was in his late, 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 later years. And then Grandpa Hansen finishes it after he passed away. So, um, oh, okay. Um, but, yep. Okay, so we finished right here. They were hard to beat. They were a hard basketball team to beat in, in Clear Creek, like a tiny little mining town. <laughs> Everybody, all the other two teams in town tried to beat them and never could. Yeah, exactly. They were they were tough to beat in the small pond that they. <laughs> That's and, wild. I want to go. I want to go see Clear Creek. That seems like a pretty cool place up there. Yeah, that'd be. Oh, we should do that. Maybe that's what we should do next this weekend. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Alrighty. Okay. That was good. Damn. We'll see ya.